apparently a, a, a serendipitous uh, YouTube channel developed from it from this too. So, uh, with with eleven hundred followers, apparently. <laughs> so, Evidently, that's uh, fantastic. No effort because I didn't. I didn't do it. I don't know how it happened. But it, it, I, well, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I am. Um, I'm not technically savvy. I am. I'm not of the age where I'm on the interwebs all the time or worried about social media. But as you serendipitously found there are videos of me out there so that's mm -hmm. fantastic yeah things these things take on a life of their own so yeah if anybody's got their uh, mics on uh except for the, our guest please shut it turn it off and uh um we're gonna you, but this is dr deidre mason you're in seattle i believe i'm not you know i am i do hail from the west coast uh, ended up in Mount Sinai uh, at, in Miami Beach, Florida, and now I am in Greensboro, North Carolina. Oh, okay. All right. So um, I'm all over the map. Yeah. Introduce yourself and let us, let us know, uh, tell us about yourself. And then um, you can, at the bottom there, you can see the share the screen if you I have, do, the, I uh, that. If you have slides um, and then go for it. That's fantastic. You guys, thank you so much for being here. This is a huge honor for me, a huge pleasure. My name is Dr. D, as I am uh, known to my friends and, uh, and colleagues. Uh, my background as a naturopathic physician came from National University of Naturopathic Medicine over there in, Green, or in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, I am a prescribing physician, a primary care physician. Uh, licensed in Oregon, although I am now the director of clinical education uh, for a nonprofit, the NEI, the Nutrimetric Educational Institute. And Jane may have also shared with you that I'm also the vice president of product development for the professional brand of products, Nutrimetrics. So one thing I would love to be able to do is answer any questions you may have about the supplement industry. I happen to be behind that curtain and I can answer and hopefully debunk some of the myths around it. But at my heart, I am a primary care physician. My background is in fertility. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty proud of the number of women I've knocked up. So that is what we did. Um, I uh, worked with micronutrient therapies to make sure that I could help women. Um, we did bioidentical hormone therapies. Uh, so it wasn't just fertility medicine that I had an opportunity to do, but women's health is my specialty. That's not what we're going to talk about here tonight. Um, but, uh, but it is uh, one of the things that I'd love to talk about. Tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about moving past micronutrient options and uh, share with you some of the things that maybe you're not hearing all the time about uh, B vitamins, magnesium, and the like. So if you'll bear with me, I will share my screen. Dr. D, if you click on three buttons. I did, just down here, I hit share. Okay. Is that and where you wanted me to be, Jane? Well, in your box uh, where your face is, if you yeah. have three buttons that you can have your presentation and yourself be the main thing on the screen. So it's nice. great for recording. And I think each person can do the same thing. They can make you have, be the main person on it. Yes, I have her as a full screen, so. Oh, I'm giving away my my punch lines, you guys. All right. As I had just shared briefly, I am a naturopathic physician and educator. As I said, I graduated from National University of Natural Medicine. Um, 24 years as a licensed naturopathic physician. I am, as I mentioned, the clinical director for a nonprofit, the NEI Educational Institute. And I have been lecturing on lifestyle medicine, nutrigenomics, obesity, fertility. Uh, and uh, I would say that of those, my favorite is fertility and nutrigenomics. Uh, 
I think as a naturopath, it won't surprise anyone that gut health tends to be the core of what I do or the core of how I work uh, with individuals. You know, custom dictates when there's good news and bad news that you need to give the bad news first. I am uh, not a big fan of biohacking. If any of you showed up tonight for a biohacking lecture, that's not really my vibe. And it has a lot to do with the fact that our patients and that communication with our patients needs to be such that we're encouraging them to take fundamental steps towards better health, right? Not shooting for that 1% uh, when they haven't even paid attention to the strength of their foundation, the strength of their structure, the strength of their immune system. So tonight's lecture will definitely not be sharing any biohacking tips, but hopefully some fun information, some new information, something that you don't already know. What I'd like to do as the corner of any presentation that I give is to talk about the fundamentals, right? Because in the pursuit of an answer to what is ultimately a very complex question, uh, longevity being that complex question, better brain health, a better night's sleep. Our patients come to us with so many complex questions, and yet they're often overlooking the simple answers to, uh, to what they could do today, what's really actionable and within their capacity. And this is why I do think it's profoundly beneficial to make sure that our patients are micronutrients sound. And we can do that through supplementation. I did it through IV therapy. Many of you may do it through different, uh, um, different modalities. But at first, sending that direct message to our patients about diet and the importance of micronutrients. If you can do nothing better for yourself today, you will get a good night's sleep. And that's hard to talk to uh, for so many of our patients. But in particular, this group here through residency, none of us really got a, enough sleep. And we really damaged our bodies as a result of the way we lived our lives for so many years. And maybe we're still doing that today. So I will maintain if there's one thing you can do for your health, it will be get a good night's sleep exercise. Jane and others will tell you I'm a big fan of picking up heavy things and putting them back down again, but it's not just for muscular physique. This is, I think, one of the simplest answers to longevity, the creation of BDNF, uh, the uh, supplanting of the circadian rhythm and putting it back because we did ruin it uh, over the last handful of decades of our lives. Our patients are just wrecking it uh, with diet and then stress hygiene of these. Hey, Dr. D. Yeah. Interject just so Please. you know, we're not seeing your screen share yet. God bless. <laughs> Sweet Christmas, Joel. Right. <laughs> How about there? Nope, not yet. <laughs> didn't want okay. you to get too far. I did. Well, I'm glad you didn't let me get too far. Let's try this again, my party people. Let me text Kyle. Is Kyle our resident millennial that's going to help the 55 year old figure out how to use it? He's part of this. He's part of this whole process. But he has I'm kids. For the window where I got to see you guys earlier. I'm not enlarged anymore, um, but unlike Zoom, where there's an icon that I can grab that kind of brings me back to the buttons that Jane was helping me with. Okay. I take it you don't see the screen share down below? No, yeah, well, I just didn't find it. I've got probably too many tabs open. How many of your brains are working like that, right? You've got too <laughs> many tabs open. Let's try this again. I'm on screen share. Okay. I chose, I've got the option of uh, window or entire screen. Last time I chose entire screen. Okay. One of the things with this program is it, uh, I found out you have to uh, have to have, this was the only tab you need to be open. So, or okay. uh, that in, your, that in your, your presentation. Okay. So we're going to try this. Um, when I do this, what do you see? You. Is it still just me? This is still just, well, that's my biopic, but. 
Okay, so you still don't see slides? No. I'm talking to Kyle right now, but he's boarding a flight right now. He's in the middle of getting on a plane, so he's going to try to help. Yeah, sure. At the base of our screens together, there is a share screen option, but what I just heard Dr. Uh, William, you said that it won't be necessary for me to use that share screen option. Is that correct? No, no. The, you need to shoot, use that. Okay. That's where I was before. So then I am choosing either Microsoft Edge window or entire screen. I go, chosen. Go entire screen. Entire screen. Yes. Yeah. And I had to use Google once. Google. Uh, Okay, can you? There we go. Wait, we're getting close. It says I got a thing that says Dr. D is screen sharing. There You're we good go. now. You're okay. good. We got it. We got it. We got Brilliant. You. Brilliant. There we go. All right. Now it's going. <laughs> well, I've already ruined my joke about biohacking and what Star Trek taught us. Uh, the good news and bad news. Custom dictation. It's gone. Can you share it again? First. What's Bi that? I see a screen that says again. biohacking. Yes. Okay, we got it. Good deal. <laughs> Let me see if I max. I can't max. Oh, maximize it. Yeah, it doesn't give us the option to maximize it, though. Interesting. And is that something on my side, do you think? It might be. No, you can maximize it. You can zoom it. Which phone are you using? Which phone is she using or form? Yeah, so I all have, you gotta do is mark it as spotlight. I haven't maximized on the line, you know I'm the. Hey, that's 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 Kyle on the line. Go ahead. Yeah. Kyle. So we're gonna go ahead and, and uh, put a spotlight on the speaker and a spotlight on the uh, slides. Screen share, and that'll be uh, everything you need. Okay. Thank you. Joel, do you want me to do anything different? Uh, no, I just hit hide there it, on the screen share to get that little thingy out of the way. There you go. He he got it. About as good as we can go. Yeah. Okay, Doctor D. Fantastic. Go we ahead, again. Please. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> have a have a safe trip. Yeah, thank Thanks, you, Kyle. Sorry, sorry about that. What is often overlooked in the conversation, and really. It's not just sleep. It's not just uh, the micronutrients. It's not just picking up heavy things and putting them back down. It's that mic micronutrients do, in fact, play a huge role in skin health, our circadian rhythm, mitochondrial function, specifically through uncoupling proteins. This uncoupling protein gives your muscles the home court advantage. Of course, micronutrients, things like vitamin D, B vitamins, magnesium, they all play a role in insulin sensitivity. And I bring much of this up because in the pursuit of longevity, so many of our patients think they need to move beyond simple steps, foundational steps, and they need to find that 10% leap towards that longevity, which is why I joke that I'm not much of a biohacker because we're missing so much of the foundational aspects of well-being. So all of this, the number of different places that our micronutrients play a role makes having a diverse diet, a diet rich in color, absolutely critical to our health. Um, I don't probably have to convince any of you on that, but what I often have to convince individuals is that the we can't really go by the RDIs, the recommended daily intakes or recommended daily allowances. Because frankly, we don't really know what it takes, or what levels are necessary to stave off the diseases of aging. Uh, we don't know what is absolutely necessary to stave off chronic disease, because what micronutrients alone do not take into consideration is how well your patient sleeps. So those RDIs, those RDAs, don't pay attention to fitness, gut permeability, inflammation, family history. They're recommended daily intakes that are based off of animal studies, looking for toxicity levels, and then uh, taking a measure of that. Uh, they definitely don't take into consideration obesity today or the fact that we haven't updated recommended daily allowances or intakes since the 1990s. In fact, magnesium in 1994 was the last time they updated magnesium numbers. And today, men and women carry roughly 30 pounds more than they did in uh, the mid-90s, making obesity 
inflammation, lack of activity, lack of sleep, um, some of the factors that we just can't account, account, can't account for when it comes to recommended daily intake. And that's why we look at staggering numbers like 70% of the population not having adequate levels of vitamin D. If we can agree that adequate levels are somewhere between that 40 and 60 nanogram levels, and that you're only going to get a bump with good gut health, with good glycemic balance, with a lack of cholesterol issues of about another five nanograms for every 25 mics that we recommend. Um, even recommending vitamin D doesn't take into account how poorly permeable many people's guts are, how poor their gut barrier is. When we look at things like vitamin E, magnesium, uh, vitamin K, we all we see below levels of what we would uh, like to see for ideal health. And this is because we're not always having a conversation or our patients aren't willing to institute many of the steps towards better health that go beyond uh, understanding the recommended daily intakes or shooting for recommended daily intakes, but understanding that they're going to need to get to therapeutic or even super physiologic amounts through diet and supplementation. And this is where supplementation kind of fills in gaps where diet falls short. One of the biggest limiting factors to your patients utilizing food from diet is ultimately the way they cook. Um, we know that whether it's glucosinolates or sulfonylase from broccoli, that if you overcook a vegetable, if you overcook some of our colorful foods, you're just making them micronutrient deplete. And then, of course, there's factors like obesity that prevent absorption or simply make it a higher requirement for us to be able to get nutrients into people, meaning that supplementation is often referred to as a luxury when it becomes a pretty essential uh, application for any one of our practices. And I will tell you that I am a food first individual. I'm an exercise uh, uh, as, a, as a component of health. I will focus on sleep before I ever focus on diet or supplementation. But we do know that people can't, as they love to say, outrun a bad diet. What I love is some of the information that our patients don't know about factors like magnesium. Like that 30 extra pounds that they're carrying is meaning that the 400 uh, milligrams that they're trying to get a day just isn't sufficient. But maybe we motivate people with more information about that complex question of longevity. So we know that by increasing magnesium beyond 400 milligrams a day, getting closer to about 560 milligrams in men and about 460 to 485 milligrams of magnesium a day in women, that we can see a, a benefit to brain health, much like we saw with vitamin D, taking vitamin D past 33 nanograms and getting closer to our 60 nanograms. We were able to see not just save off concerns with bone mineral density, but start to see cardiovascular benefits, start to see glycemic control, insulin sensitivity, longevity factors turned on because of the number of receptors in the brain for vitamin D. That vitamin D can help us in so many different ways. Today, we are starting to understand that that is true about magnesium as well. Uh, we used to say that magnesium was responsible for over 300 metabolic enzymes in the body. Today, that number is counting out something closer to 600. With more and more research, we understand the role of magnesium and how we've underappreciated this mighty mineral, how important it is for glycemic health, for brain health, for brain volume, for gut barrier function, for the production of serotonin, but even the carrying or promotion of oxygen throughout the blood. Magnesium is a required cofactor, as I said, for over 600 um, metabolic enzymes today, many of those are responsible for repair of DNA. So I ask my patients, or I'll ask you, what are you doing with your spare parts? How are you making sure that you're sending the right signals to your cells, your gene code, to make sure that you can do something with those spare parts? Instead of accelerating aging, what steps are we taking to decelerate aging, to add to the longevity question? I say all of this because we overlook this mighty mineral. We also overlook 
um, and our patients do this more than we do, they overlook how important the form of magnesium that an individual is taking. Uh, they may get something over the counter where they're getting a magnesium oxide uh, and they're not sleeping, right? They're passing, you know, they're, they have no trouble e evacuating. They have no trouble with uh, using the bathroom, but they're having trouble, they're still having trouble sleeping because you're using a very poor form of magnesium. And we know that today that magnesium threonate, glycinate, citrate, the uh, malate, that these all are playing a different role in different compartments of our body. So actually paying attention to a magnesium complement is what today we understand is important for gut health, for serotonin production, for norepinephrine and dopamine's balance in the body. But that if you have elevated blood sugar, that you have a disrupted or tore up gut, that you're just simply going to burn through magnesium and not really allow through the triage theory your body to protect other critical areas of longevity, like we're seeing here when it comes to early onset dementia, brain volume, or brain health as we age. So we do know that there are validated ways to support our overall health. And I will, as I had joked, good news and bad news. Uh, I'm taking tonight's opportunity, this may be good news or bad news, and taking tonight's opportunity to talk about gut health, to talk about the things that we can do to, to change the microbiome in a way beyond micronutrient therapies, even though that's where we start. So we know that there are certain things we do to validate um, or that are validated to change lifestyle, to change gut health, to change uh, our patient's brain health and answer that complex question about longevity. We know we need to intake fiber and fermented foods. We know we need to optimize sleep, exercise regularly, and we need to do things to uh, enhance microbiome resilience, in particular from an immune standpoint, but also from a brain and mental health standpoint. And this is where for many of our patients, supplementation will come in because they will have a hard time relaxing or staying calm. They will have a hard time getting a good night sleep. They will have a hard time resetting the gut biome without the help of supplementation, without the help of something to promote natural energy within the body instead of something that comes out of a can. And that's why I love talking about the gut brain axis, because when we can focus on gut permeability, gut health, the vagus nerve, we're not just supporting the gut digestion, but the total body axis. We're paying attention to how the gut communicates with the liver, how the gut communicates with the thyroid, how it communicates with the brain, but that your gut microflora, your oral microflora, the ecosystem throughout your body is responsible for fertility, for vaginal health, for mental health and well-being. So we know that the gut-brain axis beyond micronutrients needs to be a focus for all of us because rising rates of neuropsychiatric disorders uh, easily parallel or map out with the consumption of ultra-processed foods in um, in each and every one of our patients' lives and sometimes creeps into our own. New to nature molecules that have found their way into our water, our food, uh, have or our food-like stuffs, uh, added uh, sugars have disrupted the gut biome to a significant amount. And that disruption, that dysbiotic shift is now leading to more and more concerns that we have with mental emotional disorders, imbalance in the body. We know that vitamin D uh, uh, has a, a big role in uh, T regulatory uh, cells in promoting immune function, but also in in uh, mental health and well-being. But the target for that, the hub of that, of course, is the gut. An individual that is overly stressed, sleep deprived, uh, sleep deprived, not hydrating well enough. Um, uh, is eating a hypersaturated fat diet, they will start to also see a dysbiotic shift and that will start to affect brain health, including brain volume as they age. So when it comes to gut biome um, benefits, getting beyond things like probiotics and fibers, although I, fiber I am going to talk about short chain fatty acids, there are certain things that help us communicate through the gut to the brain or other areas in the total body axis. Um, utilizing things like turmeric, uh, uh, broccoli seed extracts, 
um, broccoli itself or sulfonylase uh, enzymes, omega-3 fatty acids, and vitamin D. I do find when I'm trying to target uh, gut health with an individual, mental health with an individual, longevity with an individual, I will first focus on what am I going to do to help detox the body because you cannot age well if you cannot detox well. How am I going to target universals within the body with things like omega-3 fatty acids and the role they play, not just in neurologic health and well-being, but everyday well being. Uh, we know that individuals that have, uh, whether we're measuring them on red blood cells or white blood cells, individuals that have a higher omega-3 fatty acid uh, score uh, uh, tend to have not just lower levels of inflammation within the body, they tend to have healthier barrier function within the gut. They tend to be able to uh, manage uh, chronic disease in a way that their counterparts are not doing. And yet it's one of those simple interventions to our health. It's one of those simple interventions or steps that our patients can take, but have somewhere put by the wayside because they're in search of something far sexier than an omega-3 fatty acid, a broccoli seed extract, or even vitamin D. We know that the combination of these things, nothing in nature acts in exclusion, right? It's not how you find uh, vitamins, minerals, fatty acids in nature, right? Excluded from their counterparts. So we, we know that the combination of nutrients is critical for managing chronic disease. Uh, just briefly looking at vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids, playing a role in serotonin production, playing a role in that gut-brain axis, that vagal nerve activity, so that we're actually able to not just create a serotonin GABA uh, uh, in the gut, but we're actually able to transport them through the vagal nerve to the brain, that we're able to move them. And this is where things like turmeric can be wildly beneficial as well. But we know that there's applications for simple steps that don't require super physiologic amounts of vitamin D and omegas to be able to reach uh, some of our targets or some of our goals. Uh, vitamin D, I, it is one of my favorites, and I don't just say that because they named it after me, right? Vitamin D, um, for all of the conversation that's going on right now about whether or not it does or doesn't uh, protect us from a fall as we age, the conversation around vitamin D and more importantly, vitamin D insufficiency is still a, uh, is still a very uh, important one. Um, because we know that vitamin D helps more than it hinders when we're able to keep people in healthy ranges. We know that vitamin D predisposes us to gut uh, dysfunction, a dysbiotic shift. We know that it plays an enormous role in vitamin D and Treg. Uh, um, activity. And for that reason, there's more good than there is bad about uh, vitamin D. And I would venture to guess that few of you are having the conversation about bad aspects of vitamin D as opposed to how to properly manage uh, patients or not letting vitamin D uh, supplementation as so many people have done be the end all and be all for, uh, for health. I think we do fall into those trends. I think we fall into those biases where we say, you know, we're going to take care of everything uh, uh, with vitamin D or everything with omega-3 fatty acids when it's actually the combination of these things in our diet and then supplementation that will make the biggest difference. Uh, uh, step forward. When we look at some of the applications for vitamin D that don't always get appreciated by our patients or even our colleagues is uh, the importance of vitamin D for blood sugar management, but also for the support of downstream sex hormones. Cholesterol is a major player uh, in your sex hormones. I don't have to tell this group uh, that. And yet, um, in uh, the pursuit of keeping people at range and doing something about high risk uh, individuals, and I do want to I do want to be transparent here. I am a prescribing physician. Um, this is not uh, an argument against uh, statins, where that uh, where you're uh, using your clinical judgment, and that's the judicious role. I, I am a prescribing physician, uh, but I love the fact that as integrative practitioners. 
we have the opportunity to say, I can always write you a prescription later if that makes sense for what the patient that's in front of us. And that vitamin D does tend to be one of those ways that we can really move the needle in somebody's health. Um, when we look at individuals and the risk of being low vitamin D, one of the things that we're incredibly concerned about is low vitamin D levels, high cholesterol, the use of statins, and therefore the increase of uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, we're concerned about this in both men and women, but unsurprising to probably people on this call is that the risk is greater. Uh, in women, and we know that this has something to do with the aging female, the loss of the trophic factor of estrogen as she ages, and the role that trophic factors, estrogen in particular, plays on, uh, on brain health, on the aging brain, and the support of uh, her cognitive function, not just her bone function. Uh, but what takes away or stills that from her and men, of course, is abnormal blood sugars. When blood sugars are left uh, in unhealthy ranges, and we're not doing something like vitamin D to help support uh, or gut health to support healthy vitamin D levels, we're increasing concerns that we have for the uh, atrophy in the brain, risk factors for Alzheimer's, early onset dementia. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'll continue to come back to what we know about vitamin D today and that there's more good than bad when we think about vitamin D. Um, part of that has to do with it being a derivative of cholesterol, part of that having to do with the sunlight converting vitamin D into cholesterol, the importance of moving past individuals that have a tore up gut and therefore I need to find a way to get their vitamin D levels higher because they're not simply going to make the conversion as well as they could. Now this is where things like melatonin and vitamin D may be something that comes into uh, your prescription pad, because we know that melatonin may be the moonlight hormone, but vitamin D is the sunlight hormone, and they share uh, an affinity for each other's receptor sites. So one reason why I think during COVID we saw so much um, conversation around melatonin and immune function was because it actually can communicate with vitamin D receptors, meaning that vitamin D can do a whole lot more for us, in particular when we think about sleep, muscle health, um, and mental emotional health. Um, places that we never thought we would apply vitamin D, we're applying vitamin D uh, today, including uh, to the benefit of cognitive health and cognitive well-being. Why do we really want to focus on maintaining healthy levels of cholesterol? And why is vitamin D one of the options that we have to help us do that? Because vitamin D can do some of the heavy lifting when it comes to gut health, uh, endocrine function, but specifically blood sugar balance, which is a primary concern that we have for elevated cholesterol in so many individuals. That glycation of our foods, glycation of fat, uh, our lipids, uh, the lack of buoyancy in our lipids and vitamin D's role in improving buoyancy, especially along with omega-3 fatty acids, can play such uh, can play a, a more profound role uh, in our patient's overall well-being because of the literal number of places that vitamin D can attach itself and do good work. We just don't have that same kind of flexibility with the statin. We may be able to get someone to goal, but we're not able to feed their brain. We may be limiting their brain function. We're not able to feed their gut. We may be limiting their gut function. Uh, but one thing that we're definitely limiting is testosterone production in men and women, limiting the brain antioxidant benefits of cholesterol with over 900 receptors in the body for vitamin D, vitamin D being responsible for 5% of uh, genome, uh, the, the human genome's activity. We know that vitamin D is doing um, a significant lift, um, but something that it's doing that statins are not doing is helping us with blood sugar glycation or concerns that we have with elevated blood sugar in brain health or oxidation of lipids. Now we promised that we would talk about micronutrients, so I'm bringing it back to the Mighty B vitamin. Uh, specifically to focus a little bit on NAD. Um, we know that we can get through nicotinic acid, niacinamide, nicotinamide riboside, NNM, that we're able to produce or promote NAD production in the body. Whether we're doing that because it's one of the ways that we can repair spare parts, it's one of the ways that we can send 
better instructions to our DNA, especially when it's paired with magnesium, which plays a role in repair of the DNA as well. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, this is probably the hottest conversation that people are having today in the longevity space, in the biohacking space, uh, in the what is one of those steps that I can take that I just can't miss because the literature is supporting this. And I will say that with supplementation of NAD, the science is still pretty confusing, right? We have more animal studies than we have human studies. Uh, when it comes to NAD. The claims are wickedly hard to verify, which is why we're right now relying on animal studies, um, because you can look at longevity factors much easier in a mouse than you can in a human being, but it's impressive what you see with nicotinamide riboside or NAD production, boosting NAD um, by whichever precursor you decide to do it. Now, some of them are doing a little bit more of a heavy lift. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, just that really quick primer on NAD. Uh, you have over 30 trillion cells in your body and NAD is responsible for energy and damn near every one of them. It has to be present in the body for no, those nutrients to be converted into energy. Uh, nothing can live without NAD. Uh, the consequences of low NAD are similar to what we see with low glutathione, right? We're able to see um, a, a shared uh, curve or an inverse relationship between levels of glutathione and vitamin D and health. Sorry, it's not an inverse. Um, that when individuals have low uh, vitamin uh, glutathione levels and NAD levels, uh, we also see that that is paired with diseases of longevity, chronic disease, risk for brain atrophy and the like, inability to repair, inability to take care of ourselves. I like to say you're unable to do anything with your spare parts. Autoph autophagy is completely arrested. We're unable to go through natural signals in the body to arrest abnormal cell activity in the absence of vitamin D and in the absence of glutathione. And yet the exact opposite is true. When we have elevated levels of vitamin D, sufficient, I'm sorry, NAD, sufficient levels of glutathione and NAD, we see that we are able to be more resistant from a gut biome standpoint, to a brain health standpoint, to an agility standpoint, to a sleep standpoint, Overall, we are healthier individuals when NAD levels and glutathione levels are in an adequate range. Places where I think our patients could truly uh, benefit from NAD is its role in sleep and productivity. NAD uh, does a lot um, when it comes to the circadian rhythm or circadian control. So whether we are talking about patients that eat late at night, uh, when hormones that are responsible for managing those elevation in blood sugars have already uh, con gone to bed themselves. NAD has been shown to help the body be more resilient to um, some of those uh, abnormalities in our clock. We do know that mental health issues are far more prominent and uh, are prevalent in individuals that are shift workers. But there is some evidence that NAD supplementation can be beneficial in repair mechanisms in those individuals that are sleeping or eating against the clock. But because NAD is responsible for our circadian rhythm, it goes one step further and can help us with blood sugar regulation, hormones that are also on a diurnal clock, even a woman's ephridian rhythm can be helped or supported by NAD. So whether we're talking about his or her energy levels, hormone fluctuations, uh, thermogenesis, body uh, temperature, uh, overall metabolism, NAD plays a large role in helping control the signaling for that uh, in individuals, helping them get a good night sleep, maintaining a healthy cell or DNA uh, function throughout the day. Uh, if you need another reason uh, to look at NAD, uh, just knowing that it is, um, you know, the Batman or Robin to terastilabines or cert genes in the body. So our longevity genes, of course, um, are managed and supported by NAD as well. Where we end up coming into the conversation is, as many of us know, 
NAD levels will decline with age, no matter how much you exercise, which is a brilliant way to raise NAD. Fasting, a brilliant way to raise NAD. But regardless of your fasting practices and your exercise practices, the truth is NAD levels will decline uh, with age. By the time we're 50, NAD levels are probably 50% of what they were when we were in our 20s or mid 20s. Uh, which means that we're no longer as efficient. We're no longer as efficient as turning nutrients into energy, uh, supporting key factors of metabolism, including glycemic control and weight. In addition to that, NAD works as a helper molecule within the body, uh, functioning to turn on uh, genes, but also like methylation pathways, turn off other genes. I love to talk to patients about three of the longevity pathways they're going to pay attention to. They're going to pay attention to what they're doing to help uh, for healthy methylation, which is linked to the other pathway in detoxification, which is linked to the other pathways through NAD or NAD management. Some nutrients are just simply better at running through the NAD pathway, the NAD, NAD, pH pathway. Nicotinamide riboside tends to be the one that's doing the heavy lifting. You can get there with things like tryptophan, you can get there with things like niacinamide in your multivitamin, but that multivitamin was made mostly to manage or be in a healthy ratio with the other vitamins and minerals that are in that multivitamin, making supplementation in addition to. This is true for magnesium. This is true for methylated B vitamins. This is true for vitamin D. We have to move our patients past the insurance policy that a multivitamin will give them or the insurance policy that they think they have through healthy diet because age is one of the things that is not in, that has not entered into the equation when we talk about what kind of effort you need to put in to stay healthy. So because the processes of NAD, any uh, DNA repair, turning on and turning off of longevity pathways uh, is, resport, uh, is so important, we have the opportunity now to answer the oxidative stress question with the introduction of NAD supplementation. We have the ability to enter into the conversation about healthy sleep, which has eluded so many of our patients, um, but one of um, it's eluded so many of our patients. But one of the things to pay attention to is again sending the signals or sending the right messages to our patients that we do still want them to pick up heavy things and put them back down again. We do still want them uh, to eat. Uh, healthy foods. We do still want them to supplement towards their better health, but identifying the right supplement for them or the right source of uh, NAD is still one of the conversations that they're going to be coming to us for. Uh, today, when you look at the, the literature, especially David Sinclair's literature, you'll hear him talk a great deal. I mean, he's the one that put, for the most part, resveratrol on the map. Well, it's those terastella beans derived um, from the skins of red wine grapes, more importantly through uh, dark blueberries uh, today, uh, that we're able to see how NAD and terastilla beans, blueberries actually function, uh, as I like, as I had referred to a moment ago, as the Batman and Robin. Maintaining healthy DNA is not based on NAD production or NAD levels alone. Um, this is something where we see uh, a passing back and forth of energy and repair mechanisms being passed back and forth between terosilabine and nicotinamide riboside. Uh, some of you may have heard that NR is the gas for the car, but terosilabine are that nitric oxide that make it go fast. If we're going to turn on uh health, if we're going to turn on the spark of metabolism, if we're going to kind of go to that seat of health, um, we want to make sure that much like the vitamin D and omegas, that we're playing those two things together. Uh, and that's why terastilla beans uh, need to be matched with uh, nicotinamide riboside. I get asked a lot, what about NMN? Uh, NMN is larger than nicotinamide riboside. Uh, so large, in fact, that uh, a look into NMN shows that it needs to be broken down to enter into the body cell. Um, meaning, while it, it is considered highly bioavailable, 
um, it does have some effort to be able to get into the cell. NR is uh, considered uh, just so equally bioavailable to NMN, uh, but is a direct path into the cell. One mechanism that the large molecule NMN uses to get into the cell is, confer, uh, is uh, reducing itself back into nicotinamide riboside, crossing the cell membrane, and then converting itself back into NMN. We see a very similar thing happen with ubiquinone and ubiquinol. Ubiquinol gets a lot of love as the reduced form of coenzyme Q10, but has a similar yin and yang or a similar back and forth or an on and off switch with uh, ubiquinone. Um, so we know that with ubiquinone, for example, that we're going uh, to uh, see higher levels of oxidative health or balance. And um, we'll see other blood sugar health benefits with ubiquinol, but they both can do the oxidative redu uh, reduction uh, dance uh, to be able to support multiple targets or multiple compartments in the body. I believe that's the way uh, we're seeing the, the studies come out today or the look at NMN and NR uh, come out today. Uh, so much of the, the bias here is that just simply supplement with nicotinamide riboside. I'll share with you, there's more uh, studies that are done, more, uh, more time that has been invested in nicotinamide riboside. And I do think that's part of the answer. Uh, to this when it comes to NMN and NR is much of what we learned uh, in 2013 about ethyl ester forms of omegas and triglyceride forms of omegas today. The question came down to bioavailability. Both of them performed equally well in the body when it came to cardiovascular health, joint health, neurologic health, but one of them was more bioavailable. Uh, than the other. And then in 2013, we were told to stop using, especially in men's health, omega-3 fatty acids at all, right? And so in the face of thousands and thousands of uh, articles telling us to use omega-3 fatty acids, we weren't as practitioners going to let one get in the way. But it was easy to fall back on omega-3 in the ethyl ester form versus triglycerides at the time, simply because there was more evidence for it. It didn't mean that triglyceride forms of omegas uh, weren't going to perform um, or that the literature wasn't going to catch up with it. I think that we're in a similar place with NMN and nicotinamide riboside. There's just been more investment into the NR molecule um, if you're talking about oral health and well-being. Um, we do get asked, do I need to supplement with nicotinamide riboside? Is it absolutely critical that I have a resveratrol supplement or that I'm using terastella beans? You can sleep to your benefit for NAD and glutathione production in the body for diet and exercise to push yourself and keep those levels up. Um, and I think we should do all of those things. And I'm a, I, like I said, I'm a food first individual. I'm not a supplement first individual. But we may not be able to outrace our NAD decline, just like none of us are going to outrace the loss of depth of slow wave sleep or our deep sleep, right? Age is just something that's going to take those windows away from us. And as a result, we need to think about what we're going to have a higher commitment to. And supplementation with nicotinamide riboside or NAD boosting uh, has shown to be one of the ways that we can fill in that gap or outrace uh, that circadian clock or that longevity clock. Taking the right supplement definitely does help raise your NAD levels. In all fairness, you can do it with nicotin, you can do it with niacinamide, you can do it with nicotinamin, uh, nicotinic acid, you can do it with NR, NMN, um, uh, you can even do it with curcumin as a precursor. You can do it with tryptophan as a precursor. Not all of these are super efficient. Tryptophan is considered the least sufficient way for you to create uh, NAD in the body. And right now, um, what they'll say is that nicotinamide riboside is the most efficient or most effective way for you to raise your NAD levels. I still feel like exercise is the answer. During exercise or fasting, um, we simply send that hermetic stressor to the body to do something about NAD, to start the autophagy process, 
to start the what am I going to do with some of these spare parts. Um, that that pressure, that hermetic stressor, definitely lends to increasing your NAD uh, levels more so than uh, diet and sleep do. Although sleep is in such a close race uh, with picking up heavy things and putting them back down again, um, but it's actually the exercise that really stimulates that nitric oxide in the or that nitric. Uh, well, we'll call it nitric oxide for this. Um, um, uh, in the car to really get uh, turning it into jet fuel, right? So that we no longer feel like we're running around in a Yugo, but that we're actually able, uh, that we can be jet propulsed. Uh, exercise is one of those things that really does that when it comes to our longevity genes, the SR genes. Uh, one of the other reasons why I'll share with you, I'm a big fan of exercise is because of its role in improving BDNF. Baseline BDNF uh, are uh, intimately linked, correlated with early on fat dementia, concerns that we have with health, concerns that we have with uh, brain um, memory plasticity, all, neuroplasticity, all of it. BDNF acts as a signal to increase the growth of new brain cells, uh, specifically in the memory center, the hippocampus. But if we're not sleeping well, if we're not moving well, if we're overly stressed, of course, if we have elevated sugar in our diets, um, we're going to limit BDNF's activity in the body, its uh, production in the body. Resistance training, spinning, wicked good for improving at BDNF. Resistance training, picking up heavy things and putting them back down again, incredibly important to increase BDNF. Something that surprises people is that we can raise at BDNF with curcumin. Um, I call curcumins, uh, curcumins, uh, curcuminoids, um, my exercise in a bottle. We know that taking DHA supplement um, does improve not just brain volume, um, but uh, also BDNF. We know that oral CBD plays a role in increasing uh, BDNF. Uh, these also have a role, if you're unfamiliar, with serotonin production, uh, uh, much like we had, uh, had talked about earlier uh, when it came to healthy gut and vitamin D and omegas. All of, we find so many things can get back to that path of mental health and well-being, mental balance, and the target is very often um, the gut. If it's not the gut, it's sleep, which doesn't surprise anybody. If it's not sleep, it's exercise. And so we underappreciate or our patients underappreciate uh, the role of, of those three things. And we'll often look for supplementation as a way to fill in gaps or to make it easier for them to exercise, easier to sleep, or easier for them to manage their stress. And this is why I say the most important thing you need to improve your BDNF is not CBD, it's not curcumin, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a pair of running shoes. That's going to be uh, the most important thing that we do when it comes to longevity, when it comes uh, to health. Uh, when we look at recommendations, this is from Paul Mutter and Rhonda Patrick, Exerc uh, aerobic exercise uh, for minimum, uh, getting into a uh, high, inten uh, high intensity work for 20 minutes, five days a week um, is necessary. That's a necessary or a sufficient amount of hormetic stressor physical stressor on the body to initiate change. And that's something that a lot of our patients will ask about. What I want to do right now, I will share with you that uh, I will keep you here till midnight if you let me. My nickname in high school was Chatterbox. I would love to keep going, but I know that I am out of time. Um, one of uh, the targets I wanted to get to tonight, and I apologize for not getting to. You can keep the, going. Dr. D, okay. keep going. Um, if, what, what I really love talking about is the enteric nervous system, the gut brain barriers. We started to get to, but I wanted to make sure that I had a chance to speak about uh, B vitamins, specifically NAD. But at the end of the day, if we're going to make our patients happy, if we're going to make our patients uh, fertile, if we're going to make our patients, uh, you know, help them maintain their cognitive function, we're going to target uh, that gut. Uh, gut permeability is critically important uh, for blood sugar balance, for immune balance, cognitive uh, balance. Disturbances 
uh, in the gut biome, a dysbiotic shift, we often will see with concerns with insulin sensitivity beyond the immune function, beyond um, um, allergies, food sensitivities, those sorts of things. Uh, you know, my biggest target and the reason why I talk about gut permeability uh, and the health of the gut as much as I do is because my role in getting women pregnant was to make sure that their blood sugars were in really healthy ranges. It was so important for their diets to be healthy, but what I was really targeting was making sure that they could get pregnant by making sure we were doing something about insulin sensitivity and that any disruption in the gut made it harder for me to keep a hirsute female, a polycystic ovarian a female, a depressed a female or male in a healthy space. And so I will always go back and start with the gut. I think many of us agree that that, that is the rule of functional medicine is to uh, simply start with the gut. Uh, there are all kinds of different things that we have in our toolbox, in our medicine box, um, and in our diagnostic box to pay to identify if somebody has uh, dysbiosis, if they have issues. Uh, whether we're doing allergy testing, we're doing uh, gut, uh, we're doing stool analysis. We're simply looking for zonulin. We're uh, we go high level or we go low level. There tends to be something that's keeps coming back and says, if you can implement this, you'll see so many of these other inflammatory markers start to decline. You'll see immune function start to manage itself. You'll see vascular function, mental health start to manage itself. And that is short chain fatty acids. Uh, short chain fatty acids, a, a disrupted gut has uh, a great deal of uh, oxidative stress in it. It has that dysbiotic shift. Uh, we see uh, poor energy metabolism and excess fat deposition and insulin resistance when we have a hyperpermeable gut. Uh, those short chain fatty acids, whether they come from a fiber rich diet, uh, which frankly, we need to focus more on fibers that our patients are often not eating like inulin and chicory root. If we're going to raise levels of acromancia, if we're going to raise levels of butyrate in the body, or we're going to go straight to the source and we're going to supplement with short chain fatty acids. I will share with you the inulin, chicory root, Jer Jerusalem artichoke, um, uh, tend to be some of the best ways that you're going to create short chain fatty acids in the gut. We do often recommend our patients focus on a fiber rich diet, uh, but don't give them all of the information that they need that many of the fiber rich, rich foods that they're consuming may help them with glycemic control, but aren't helping them with the production of uh, in a, in a meaningful way with short chain fatty acids. So the first rule of integrative health is to heal the gut first. And we know that short chain fatty acids contribute to maintaining that healthy gut barrier. Those tight junctions, uh, specifically uh, butyrate does a lot of the heavy lifting here. Um, we know that we are with short chain fatty acids, we're able to do something about arresting the production of lipopolysaccharides, which today are not just linked to a hyperpermeable gut, they're linked to cardiovascular disease, including coronary artery disease, and uh, many individuals with uh, depression and anxiety, that short chain fatty acids, or that uh, lipopolysaccharides uh, are uh, play a role in that because of their translocation. We know that short chain fatty acids possess anti-inflammatory benefits, uh, help us with our cytokine response. Um, I happen to be a big fan of curcumin, astaxanthin, and short chain fatty acids uh, together. But if there was any combination, um, I was going uh, any combination I would put uh, with a short chain fatty acid. It would either be an omega three fatty acid, a black seed oil, or a berberine. And tonight I'm going to talk just briefly about how short chain fatty acids and berberine may be one of our answers. Uh, to GLP-1 um, activity in the body, which does make it a little bit sexier uh, for some of our patients. Can you go back one slide real quick? You got it. Question. Okay, the uh, sixth picture on the bottom, it says, oh, that's all right. That's me. <laughs> there we go. It says, I'm not touching anything. it says regulation of immune. On my screen, it has a little screen 
that blocks out the picture. So what does it say? Regulation of immune responses and cytokine production. It's, it looks like it says regulation of immune. Oh, no, no, I see. No, I was blocked. I was blocked in the wrong one. Regulation of immune cells to prevent excessive inflammation. Nice. Somebody moved I the picture. It. That's You're awesome. Thank you very much. I was linked. That was in the wrong spot there. Sweet Christmas people. <laughs> We can assess um, permeability of the gut by measuring LPS levels, zonulin levels, um, oxidation of short chain uh, fatty acids. Um, we know, uh, pulled from another slide, uh, apologize for the typo there. Uh, if the gut lining is, le uh, is leaky, uh, we will see a dysbiotic shift. Um, we can uh, see lipopolysaccharides in, uh, uh, then identify lipopolysaccharides where they don't belong. And that's that translocation that I was talking about. Uh, one thing, much like we talked about with chronic disease, that elevated or sufficient NAD levels and glutathione levels are linked uh, to when we see them high, we see individuals of healthy uh, body composition, healthy energy, healthy biologic age. Um, we see something linked um, with many of the neurodegenerative uh, disorders, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, autism, even Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, linked to that translocation of lipopolysaccharides, which is why I said it goes beyond food sensitivities. It starts to get into um, uh, cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and then some of the concerns that we have with brain health and brain function. Uh, we do see a lot of atrophic uh, uh, changes in the gut, I'll often refer to this uh, as starving amongst plenty, um, that uh, the gut health, the gut lining, uh, the gut barrier is uh, starving um, amongst uh, plenty of bacteria that are eating the mucin. Uh, when we see elevated lipopolysaccharides, a dysbiotic shift, what's ultimately happening there is uh, the mucin layer that would otherwise be protecting us um, is eaten up and we start to see that uh, that leaky gut and we start to see a leading to inflammation, uh, leading to releasing of endotoxins from lipopolysaccharides. And this is why we see that link to coronary artery disease where cholesterol comes in to try to save the day. Uh, and yet if you've got patients where we're trying to lower their uh, cholesterol. That's like trying to kick the firemen out. It's trying to come and address the fire in the body. Uh, so we do know that lipopolysaccharides trigger a significant immune response in the body, that chronic exposure to lipopolysaccharides uh, contribute to the development of chronic inflammatory diseases, including heart disease and insulin resistance, which is why it's always been um, my target. Uh, it was only after more research and more reading that I learned more about neuroinflammatory conditions or cognitive impairment or the translocation of lipopolysaccharides. So what is the goal? The goal is to focus on uh, a leaky gut. If we can appreciate that a leaky gut means a leaky brain, then the answer to this is the gut brain axis. The access to this is something that communicates through the body and that is butyrate. We know that butyrate can influence our immune response by promoting regulatory uh, or Tregs, a, a regulatory uh, immune uh, function in the body, an anti-inflammatory environment. We know that uh, um, while vitamin D can do some similar things, uh, that short chain fatty acids tend to be a greater local response uh, when it comes to immune cell activity, simply because they're going to prevent lipopolysaccharides from leaking into the blood, into the blood. Um, butyrate is uh, a fermentation uh, process uh, from fiber, as I had mentioned. Certain fibers do a better job. Insulin, Jerusalem artichoke, trickery, that family is doing some of the heavy lifting when it comes to creating um, a healthy gut biota, a healthy gut uh, biome or an ecosystem within the gut. One thing that I think some of our, uh, sometimes our colleagues don't know is that butyrate is the, is the primary short chain fatty acid that we're looking at to raise in the body. While you do have 
uh, three really important short chain fatty acids in the body. You've got propionate, you've got acid, uh, acetate, and you've got butyrate. An excess of propionate or an excess of acetate lead to blood sugar storage, lead to lipid storage. Butyrate, much like Butyrate is the one that is the strongest lifter when it comes to energy metabolism, partitioning energy in the body, making sure that the aging body where aging is expensive and just requires more energy for currency, you know, for that exchange for healthy um, bio age. Uh, that is really butyrate that is doing uh, most of the work when it comes to uh, that energy exchange or that energy uh, partitioning. And so we want to have uh, an abundance of butyrate when we compare it to things like acetate or propionate. One other benefit to butyrate that we don't get from acetate or propionate to the same extent um, is it's, a, it's a, a potent inhibitor of um, HGA1 or uh, histone uh, deacylase. So when we think about people with mast cell, hyper mast cell activity, when we think about our migraine sufferers, when we think about individuals uh, that have a histamine response to their probiotics, um, we may want to be thinking about short chain uh, fatty acids. Um, because this is one of the ways through this isolation is one of the ways that we're able to modulate mast cell activity um, or their uh, hair-like trigger uh, to an individual that is sensitive, uh, sens uh, that is hypersensitive to their environment, but also really beneficial in an individual short chain fatty acids, very in, uh, beneficial in uh, the individual that's not just concerned about insulin resistance, but we may be seeing some uh, female issues like a predominance towards migraine suffering. Um, I want us to go back to the gut and look at it there. Butyrate possesses its own anti-inflammatory process. It can uh, dampen down pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, or uh, issues that we have with hypermast cell activation. Uh, it does inhibit the production of certain uh, uh, cytokines or interleukins, uh, interleukin-6, uh, uh, tumor necrosing factor alpha, interleukin-2. Uh, but one of the things that I don't have here that is, uh, I'm remiss, is that we see that IL-10 is improved with short-chain fatty acid um, activity. And that's the one that's intimately linked. IL-10 is intimately linked to uncoupling proteins and uh, energy metabolism and mitochondrial function. You know, it's it's uncoupling proteins. You, uh, you see P1 that gives muscles the home cord advantage over adipose tissue, especially when we think about longevity factors, mitochondrial function, concerns that we have uh, with blood sugar issues. So one of the functions here talking about this with mast cell activation is that by reducing the production of tumor necrosing factor alpha, the uh, pro-inflammatory interleukins, butyrate can uh, manage many of our uh, mast cell uh, patients. Uh, it's silly not to talk about acromantia when we talk about short chain fatty acids. Uh, it would be silly not to talk about how certain uh, um, acidophilus uh, bacteria, um, acidophilus plantarum, acidophilus rhamnosum, paracaceae, they don't just play a role in cardiovascular health. These aren't just the skinny bugs, um, but one mechanism that we think that leads plantarum and paracaceae in particular to be skinny bugs um, is the fact that they do promote the production of ac uh, acromantia within the gut. Um, but butyrate does it at a faster rate. Butyrate can uh, not just preserve mucus within that, uh, in the gut to limit hyperpermeability of the gut, but it also uh, can lead to the production of acromantia in the gut. But the heavy lifting for me comes to the role of short chain fatty acids, metabolism, insulin sensitivity, and energy levels. I talked about my love of the gut brain axis, how we can influence um, a leaky gut and a leaky brain with things like short chain fatty acids. But what I don't think we know enough about today, but there's exciting research behind butyrate 
uh, short chain fatty acids being linked to GLP-1 agonism. Um, so the hormones involved in, uh, I don't have to tell this group, but the hormones involved in glucose metabolism and insulin secretion that those GLP-1 glucagon-like peptide um, uh, don't just play a role. Uh, you know, one of the ways that we know that we can uh, enhance GLP-1 activity in the body is with a good night's sleep, is of course with movement, but it's also with making sure that the gut is very healthy. So short chain fatty acids have been shown in the literature to stimulate the release of, G uh, the release of GLP-1 um, from enterocytes, enteroendocrine cells within the intestinal lining. Um, this is one mechanism for insulin sensitivity. This is one mechanism for blood sugar management. And part of that is that that mechanism is part of that energy partitioning in the body, making sure that the body uses energy the way it's supposed to. Um, so we, uh, certain fermentation fibers, inulin, chicory root, uh, do a good job, excuse me, at activating specific uh, glucagon, glucagon uh, protein or G protein coupled receptors. So we see these uh, G coupled receptors in our fat cells, our adipocytes, <coughs> colon, epithelial cells, peripheral blood um, monos. Um, we see um, them being a big part of that the surface endocrine function to support healthy insulin levels, weight, and inflammation. But that starts in the gut. That's why the road to health is paved with good intestines, right? The hub to energy, the hub to healthy energy, uh, healthy aging, the hub to your thyroid functioning the way it's supposed to, and your gut gonads functioning the way they're supposed to, really is that hub. Really is the the large bowel. And I think the evidence and the um, the look that we're taking now, a deeper dive into things like short chain fatty acids and GLP one activity is really showing off all of the different ways um, that we can help people. We know that with GLP-1 agonists that we're doing something about heart disease. We know that we're, you know, every day we're learning something, another side benefit to GLP-1 activity. And yet right there in our guts for so long, we've had, uh, you know, we've had this in our arsenal, something that we can be promoting with healthy diets. So. When we look at GLP-1, it acts on pancreatic beta cells to enhance insulin uh, secretion. Uh, butyrate's been shown to have a very similar activity uh, on, uh, on individuals when it comes to insulin sensitivity, blood sugar support, and partitioning energy throughout the body. In addition to that, short-chain fatty acids play a role in regulating appetite, improving satiety in the overeating, in the overeater. We know that that gut-brain axis, that short-chain fatty acids play a role in the POMC centers in the brain for overeating or feeling satisfied. While good sleep is still one of the number one ways for you to arrest ghrelin in the body and raise leptin sensitivity in the body, we know that gut healthy short chain fatty acids and potentially berberine are some other ways that we can also speak to that POMC center in the brain and initiate satiety even in uh, overeaters. And this is, so we're going to get a lot of benefit or a lot of uh, mileage out of short chain fatty acids. Butyrate is primar uh, primarily metabolized by colonocytes. Uh, it's an energy source for all cells uh, the uh, study suggests that the metabolites, the downstream end products of butyrates uh, work within colonocytes. Colonocytes uh, produce uh, signaling molecules for insulin sensitivity uh, to support GLP-1 activity or uh, go straight to the source and improve or enhance GLP-1 uh, secretion. The last on that list that's being looked into today, um, and you've seen it in our literature, you've at least seen it in some of the rag mags that some of us uh, read, uh, that are some of the easier, lighter uh, reading is, is berberine the nexozempic? And there's good, uh, There's it's a, it's a great question. It's something that more people are getting positive answers uh, to berberine when it comes to GLP-1 agonism. We do know that it, it does come down somewhat to the form of berberine that's being used, that uh, Coptis, Barberry, uh, better than Golden Seal, are functioning. 
to help people with this, but much like short chain fatty acids, um, studies suggest that berberine does increase GLP-1 uh, signaling, that it occurs through uh, direct st stimulation of, um, that it uh, occurs through direct stimulation of uh, GLP-1, uh, where short chain fatty acids tend to hit multiple targets through their metabolites, not just a direct uh, link, which means that berberine is very much dose dependent while short chain fatty acids for GLP-1 activity um, may have an abundant question to them, uh, but they tend to have a more pleiotrophic uh, approach to gut health and then ultimately energy metabolism or energy partitioning. And scene. I did want, uh, uh, I appreciate you so much, Dr. William, letting me uh, do that um, because that was what I wanted to make sure that I did is that we got to talk about how sexy GLP-1 activity is. Mm -hmm. That was that was excellent. Thank you so much uh, I, for your presentation. Um, I'm sure we have um, some questions uh, in the audience and uh, the, uh, uh, unlike Zoom, the, the chat here sort of just flicks on and flicks off. So if anybody um, has any questions, what is the recommended dose of ber berberine? This is a great question because we're doing the same thing with NAD right now with asking how much is necessary. Uh, so this is where some of the story comes if you're using golden seal forms versus barberry coptis forms. We know with uh, coptis uh, or barberry that you can uh, use as little as 300 milligrams and still see benefit when it comes to blood sugar uh, support. Um, many of the um, lesser uh, um, potency um, botanicals that are on the market today through supplementation may mean that you need to do as much as 1500 milligrams. So anytime you're looking at supplementation, anytime you're looking at something that comes in a bottle, you definitely want to look at the percent of raw material that's being used. Because um, you'll see some uh, companies will have a product that is 300 milligrams, but it's a 98% ingredient, which means nearly all of that 300 milligrams is actually uh, the berberine alkaloid versus, um, uh, ver you know, versus a quercetin is a good example of this. Uh, onion as quercetin is about a 10% quercetin. But if you look at the Japanese pagoda tree or Sephora plant, uh, that's about a 97% um, quercetin. And for that reason, potency matters there. So the uh, the quality or the potency of the ingredient is going to matter. But for blood sugar support, it's about 300, 350 milligrams um, of a good quality ingredient that's going to make a difference. I will share with you that studies do show that the pairing of berberine and short chain fatty acids together mean that even if you have a lesser raw ingredient, uh, you can use less berberine and get more mileage out of it. And this, this is this is just the nature of potentization. Omegas and vitamin D potentize each other. We just amplify their effects. Thymoquinone. This is one my. I, I have a lecture on uh, the role of black seed oil, and thymoquinone and omegas do an amazing job together. So sometimes it's the combination of those things that will make a difference. There's there's a lot of literature about dihydroberberine. Yes. So um, and so explain the difference between the two and and is that is that a something to pay attention to or it it, it is and this has everything to do. It's a great question that has everything to do with the dihydro the shape of it. Um, we see this a lot with curcuminoids as well. Is that through the extraction process you want to hold on to as much of the intact alkaloid tannin terpenoid, whatever your ingredient is, you want to hold on to as much of its uh, its natural organic structure as possible um, through the processing uh, in the creation of a supplement. So dihydro means that it has more of its methyl groups attached, uh, Dr. Clearfield, and that so that is a, a meaningful um, a, a meaningful uh, way to look at it. So dihydro is considered um, a more 
potent or it's not potent because it's not the 98%, but it is a more bioactive because it has extra methyl groups associated with it that can support methylation pathways in the body, just cellular health or cellular metabolism. Great. Let me, can I ask you this then? So we have a rather uh, robust GLP-1 um, program here at our, at our yeah. office. And, you know, one, we, I, I read through all the criticisms and one of them is, well, when you stop it, you gain all your weight back. So my, my approach has been to use um, berberine, um, uh, 400 milligrams uh, twice a day, or 800 milligrams twice a day in a combination with gynostemma which is a um, sure. Chinese, Chinese, an AMPK uh, 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 Chinese herb that actually comes in a, we can use, we can mention brand names here. It's comes from um, New Medica. Um, you know, we're, we're not CME credits. So that's where I get yeah, that. Yeah, sure, and, exactly. And then I, I add in um, 50 to 100 milligrams, depending on what we can get of resveratrol with that. And not so much for um, uh, weight loss, but sort of weight maintenance. So Ma that, maintenance, that, that's sure. Part of our, uh, this is what you do to, to to keep it off. We've been fairly successful. We don't don't have a whole lot of information on it yet, but I, I feel I'm sort of on the way. Would uh, short chain fatty acids adding to that, or in place of one of those? Uh, um, I um, without a doubt. So the resveratrol that you're using, I imagine, has a lot to do with. Uh, the role of resveratrol in low calorie diets, longevity, maintaining a uh, healthy weight as a result of those CERT pathways, uh, living on, uh, being just more energy efficient is one of the things that resveratrol allows us uh, to do. But I think you're going to get, especially from a maintenance standpoint, but even in individuals uh, that want a little bit more gas or traction through your program, I do think short chain fatty acids are going to make a big difference there because mm -hmm. on their own, they can they can help people that are not using. You can, um, you can get some short fatty acids from probiotics, BD4 and Bactrim. I think it's a good one as a source of short uh, butyric acid. And BD4 which one is that? It's a BD4 and Bactrim. It's a probiotic. It's a probiotic oh, it's that is called PD, PD4 and Bactrim. So one thing that uh, the one that I use uh, is uh, Core Biome. Core Biome is uh, a, a, buter a tributyrin uh, that has studies on it to show that it can survive digestibility, that it can move through uh, the uh, large uh, into the large bowel. Uh, and so that's what I want you to look for is the, um, in your brand is the amount that actually is making it to the large bowel. Okay. Um, but absolutely, is, is that a, a butyrate at the end of the day is what I want people to be really focused core, on. Core Biome is a, is a brand name? Or? Core, core Biome is a, a raw ingredient that uh, a raw ingredient provider uh, supplies. So the product I use is called uh, Prime uh, Advanced Digestive Support. It's a combination of Coptis berberid uh, berberine and the short chain fatty acid core biome or tributyrin. Okay. So advanced those are not digestive those support. Are, is that that's what it's called? Advanced digestive support. That's okay. probiotics. Yeah. It's not probiotic, right? Yeah. It is not a probiotic. It's a straight short chain fatty acid product well, that. But it would be good if you have a bacteria that produces constantly butyric acid. And I think one of the top ones are the bidiform bactrim. It's, yeah, it's a, exactly. And then that's where that paracasei and that remnosin can come in and support that butyrate activity as well. One question that we have about probiotics is how well do they survive digestion? How many of them actually make it to the large bowel? Well, they, they put them activity. in a capsule and those capsules are acid resistance. Uh huh. And that delivered them to the colon. So that's right. why and, you don't take bacteria naked. Of course, it will digest. Of course. They put them in a special capsule, which is acid resistance, that would take them and release them into the colon. That's exactly what you want to do. You want to make sure that there's something in supplements that you're doing that is helping them survive digestion, that is helping them make it, uh, in this case, to the large bowel intact. I, I think we have a company that does that, which is Nodora from Hotan's pharmacist. Okay. Is it, supplying that. Fantastic. It, it has, I think it has berberine as well. But something you need to question. That would be brilliant. Yeah.
It, and it also has ginger in it. So, so I actually happen to have the box right here. <laughs> so we've got ginger all. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. Hey, Doc, can I ask about um, what you were talking about with uh, physical exercise? Yes. Right now, there's a bit of a movement in America where too much exercise is just too much. And then you have the Chinese, Japanese, and the Koreans who do their Tai Chi and they do their yoga. They don't do weightlifting like we do. They mm -hmm. don't do their cardiovascular like we do. Mm -hmm. And when they started doing that, and they started eating our diet, they started to get sick. So how much exercise do you actually think we need? And why does the Tai Chi and the yoga and the slow movement, slow body movement. Mm -hmm. mimic in, in, uh, increased anaerobic activity for them, but they don't for us? And, and we don't do it a lot. So what's what's the similarities i mean i do i do think training is you know have have everything to do with that like the the frequency of use or the frequency of exposure because we know today we can turn people into sprinters right we can get slow twitch muscles to behave with the right physical activity to behave like a fast twitch muscle and then even with age and sarcopenia as we lose fast twitch muscles and we have more slow twitch uh, muscles, which means we're not jumping in as agile as we used to be. We can retrain that. Um, I think, so I think that's part of that application is the, you know, the constant tap, 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 like what kind of signals do you send to the body? How frequently do you send those signals? I do think, um, I do think that there is a lack of recovery. And I think that that is probably one of the biggest problems that we suffer from in a Western culture is that there is a, 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 a an almost, uh, we almost look down our noses at recovery. I don't think a lot of people that are exercising today uh, spend enough, enough time in recovery. I don't think that they're repairing after they do their work. I think we, we definitely celebrate the tire flipper um, for that reason. Um, I do think that the uh, we also, because of quick access to just energy and what have you, I'm not sure many of us without a pristine practice really tap into some of the full body um, energetic benefits of Tai Chi and the like. I don't have, not being an exercise physiologist, I don't have a perfect answer for this other than we probably do go too hard in the United States. Um, we uh, do not give things the time that they need. We don't recover the way we're uh, supposed to. But we do know, especially if you look at the Buck Institute at Nutrigenomics, um, applied um, fitness, that we can turn uh, youthful genes back on with resistance training. But resist, I, I guess one way I want to answer this is resistance training doesn't have to be this freakish commitment. Like I said, flipping tires. If I can work out five days a week, I can focus on, I'll either focus on speed, I'll focus on intensity, or I'll focus on volume, right? But I don't wear myself out. I don't put all the gas in there. Then I'm going to be able to go back the next day. And that means either more reps, more intensity, or more, um, uh, have, you heard of doc, have, you, have you heard of Dr. Jockwish? The oh, yeah. oh, no, no. I thought I had. Uh, I have not. Okay. He, he wrote the book about weightlifting is a joke, and he uses armbands, and he also has a vibration plate, and he created OsteoStrong. And OsteoStrong has a um, center where you push, you pull, and you pull up, and you use your yeah. leg for 10 to 15 minutes. And you do extreme push about 10 to 15 seconds and he got into business with uh, uh tony robbins and they're having great success and they use the cuffs to help with the lymphatic drainage system they use a pmf yeah. pmef mat, mat with the cuffs they use a massage system heat and everything and then they use a bioelectro pmf type machine and they're having great success so he's starting to realize that entire system that you're talking about he's going in the opposite way and they're having great results 
because they're not going the extreme with weightlifting, but they're going with arm bands and they're going with vibration. And it's all about, like you just said, resistant training, resistant training. It's not about the weights. It's about the resistance. So I, I think we're applied resistance under load. This is what stimulates the brain. This is what stimulates the body. Yep. And then have you heard of 60 X? No. 60 X is Dan Metcalf. He has a bar system where you stand on it and it's about balance. And yeah. he realized that when you it. work on your balance, it works with your BDNF and it works with your brain. And so yes. he's gotten this with the elder population and he's having dramatic results like you know no one's ever seen see this is what i love about what dr joel's bringing up because there are 10 domains of physical fitness agility and balance are some of them and putting a barbell over your head isn't necessarily training you into those correct and so we do need to pay attention to those 10 domains of physical fitness speed and agility balance reef you know um, strength obviously is one of them, but body weight, you know, sometimes you're your very own, you're, you're your best weight, right? Hey, Joel, um, I might <clears throat> add something here that you're talking about when you talk about Tai Chi and some of these other things. I think what you're finding and you can research more on it. If you start looking at what they're talking about, overcoming isometrics, right. and that's basically what that is, is all of this stuff is isometrics, which is going to build strength it's not going to be you know the big hypertrophy gain but you're going to build strength and i think as we age maybe strength is more important than hypertrophy correct i, I think the best exercise is anti-gravity exercise which is ac um aquatherapy swimming because you don't put stress on your joints and especially if it's in uh, salt hot water like blue lagoon in iceland where i went there I mean, you can have advantage of detoxing plus exercising and strengthening inside the in the water, uh, a hot water that will um, help in the sweating and getting all the toxins out of your body. At the same time, you're exercising and squeezing um, the fat tissue in the body and getting all those things out. Uh, I think that's the best exercise uh, for pain management and for aging. I love it. I love the conversation. That's wonderful. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Um, we can't thank you enough, Dr. Mason, and please come back. I do have a question, Doc. Someone, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, Dr. Gerber asked, how do we increase butyrate, as in, you know, what type of food or how do you increase it? Uh, Jerusalem artichoke. Uh, so fibers in general, resistant starches are some of the ways that you do this. Now, some people will create a resistant starch uh, by cooking and then cooling rice overnight and then just barely warming it up just to room temperature and using that. That creates a resistant starch that tends to improve butyrate production. Um, fermented foods can produce uh, butyrate. So uh, production. But what has shown to be the best is inulin and chicory root. These are two that tend to go, uh, that that's what they want to become. They just wake up one day and hope that today's going to be the day they get to become butyrate. Isn't that a coffee? I'm just saying. Yeah, it, it's something that it, <laughs> it is something it is, uh, inulin is, uh, or chicory rather, uh, root is uh, something that's used as an, a, co a coffee alternative. Correct. Uh, just like mushrooms today are used as coffee alternatives. Yes. Wow. And then there's another question about what's your opinion about uh, pomegranate? So I um, so a lot of people are looking at pomegranate today because of urolithin A and urolithin A, which is um, uh, today is considered that apoptetic, that anti-aging. It's the fen it's the fenestine. It's it's like quercetin. Uh, today, urolithin A is being looked at as the new quercetin, and that thing is going to work in all kinds of parts of the body. What you can't get through the raw the raw pomegranate is enough urolithin A to really be a benefit. This is why we're being, seeing people supplement, and that's true for so many micronutrients. Difficult to get out of food, or some of the compounds you're just not going to get in sufficient amount. Um, 
I still think all of everything we learned uh, in 2008, 2009 about pomegranate and cardiovascular health is still true. Um, I think that when you look at a complex antioxidant, um, like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a silly test and it's not one that I want us to ever use in practice, right? But it's a great measure for our, our, um, our patients. If, if you have to use a napkin to pick up something so it doesn't stain your counter, that's a hell of an antioxidant right there. If it is so colorful that it's going <laughs> to stain your jazz, uh, right? That's a hell of an antioxidant. And that's how I feel about pomegranates. Pomegranates, uh, uh, pomegranate juice, um, the pure stuff, um, boost testosterone levels. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, right. We, use it, we, we recommend it all the time for, you know, what can we do naturally? And that's, that's one of the, that's one of the, one of the things that that's one of our go-tos, but make sure it's not pomegranate juice cocktail. Yes. It has to be the right. real deal. Right. Right. Another, another question about magnesium. There's so many different types of magnesium yeah. and you've got your brain magnesium supplements and you've got your brain sleep magnesium, magnesium supplements. Resonates. What's your favorite supplements for brain, blood, brain barrier, and for sleep? So three and eight, magnesium three and eight, that form is probably the best, whether we are thinking about it for brain health, uh, after traumatic brain injury, uh, magnesium three and eights are considered uh, incredibly beneficial. Glycinate is wicked good for sleep. Uh, glycinate is a preferred uh, form um, when we think about GABA production, uh, mm -hmm. when we think about dopamine, serotonin, uh, and the like, uh, glycinate forms are considered uh, the best form to use that with. Citrate forms tend to feed the muscle um, alkaline base balance better than some of the others. Oxides are a waste of your time in mm -hmm. every way, shape, or form. <laughs> Thank you. You got it. Awesome presentation. I loved I loved being here, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do hope I get to come back. Um, I um, I really do enjoy this. I really do enjoy spending. What are you doing in April? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like here right now. <laughs> we'll work it out. Okay, I'll talk to Jane. I'll talk about black seed oil. Black seed yeah. oil, it is. Okay, we've used that. Too. We used that in COVID. Uh, yeah, yeah, I bet you did. I can't mention that now. Right. I can't put this on YouTube. So. Now you <laughs> said it. You said it. Yeah. You're out. I, I, I messed it up again, John. You did. Yeah. We'll be scripted out. It'll be okay. So thank uh, you. Thank John, you. Any comments, John? How how's the medical school going? Everything's uh, everything everything everywhere is hundred percent wonderful except for feedback on this mic. Yeah, well, you know, I I'm gonna talk to them about uh fixing up this platform. It's been a it's been a uh bit of a problem ever since we started with it so yeah. do you do you think it's the platform john or do you think it's your mic well again our, our guests will always have trouble getting uh get if, I shared, if i showed you what's on the screen you wouldn't believe it so i'll send you a clip <laughs> okay thank you thank you thank all you all right dr mason thank you so much i, I really we really appreciate it dr um or dr santangelo <laughs> Uh, or whatever you are. <laughs> so if you, you're not a doctor, you are now. You are to us. Right? Exactly. Like, as far as other, you know. Other as far other, as right? you know, yeah. Right. Other, so like Jake oh, Campbell. Thank you, Dr. Right. D. That was just tr truly, this is how she always is, guys. Incredible. Thanks thank so, much. so much. Thank, and thank you for uh, for bringing your, some of your colleagues uh, here. They've been, uh, they've been terrific. So. Uh, so, Dr. Mason, we're not going to. You know, we we have a we have a rule of thumb here that if uh, if if we don't call you back, then uh, uh, it, then you know you weren't all that good. That's the right. Well, when, when someone's competent, um, you know, then we then we're going to annoy you. <laughs> so I love it. I love it. So thank well, you I so do, much. I so appreciate the invitation. I just loved it. Thank you, everyone. So thank you so much. And and you know we're here every just here's our our, our our cheap advertisement. We're here every Tuesday. We've been here since okay. October 2020. Every Tuesday at five o'clock uh, Pacific, eight o'clock Eastern. Um, if anybody on, on is uh, has anything they'd like to present, please let me know. Bring one friend every week, and we double our census. Um, there you go. And um, uh, and if you're um, at all interested, Dr. Mason, uh, we can put you on our email list, so we'll let you know what what's coming up for us next week. We have Beth Shirley, and she is going to be speaking uh, on EMFs. So that's next week. Nice. 
when hey, I'd Dr. Love Doc, it. if I can, um, can you put your information or your email or how you'd like to be contacted in the chat yes. so us can contact you? Because some of us are on multiple Zooms that are, you know, going on throughout America. There's four or five that I'm, you know, in, and we would love to get this information throughout everybody involved. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you very much. You got my pleasure. <laughs> That'll work. Okay. Go be healthy. Go be brilliant, everyone. I know those 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 chat things go go off in a second. So I'll I'll get your information from Jane. I'll get everything to you, Doc. Perfect. Okay. okay. All Thanks right. Again, uh, anybody Jane. else? Wonderful. Comments, Thank questions. Um, uh, we'll have our video up on AOSRD.org uh, as soon as uh, I, we get it rendered, and it's also on our YouTube channel. Uh, which came about serendipitously. So it's Clearfield Medical Group <laughs> is our YouTube channel. Um, so it'll be there also. Um, and again, thank you so much. Again, next week, uh, uh, we have Beth Shirley who's going to be talking about EMFs. Anybody else has any comments or questions, please let us know. Um, and um, if that's uh, uh, that's a wrap, we'll say good night. Um, say, say hi to Dr. Uh, uh, Spears for us, uh, Dr., Dr. Renza. So I will. I wonder why he better start showing up. Yeah, you tell him. Uh, you know, he's uh, that those young you youngsters. Uh, you know, you you can't be slacking. So. <laughs> There's no such thing as retirement. Yeah. <laughs> so that. Dr. Renza there and and the, the Dr. Spears uh, talking about those are our, our our senior senior members. They're they, they're they, your they, pioneers. Yeah, That's they, right. they were they. You were around from the beginning, weren't you? When AS AOSRD or whatever it was called. They before. still. <laughs> Yeah, they used to come out here to. So I live in Reno. They used to come out here so they could go skiing, and they formed a, a medical uh, organization to to uh, take advantage of what you can take advantage of there. So that, that's that's how we all started here. So thanks Guys, so much. Um, and again, anybody else have any comments, questions? Um, thank you all for being here. And I'm going to say good night, and uh, we'll um, we'll meet again next next week. Love it. Thank Don't be a stranger. <laughs> and let's see.